Amen. Open your Bibles, please, to uh, Romans chapter 10. Open your bulletin to the outline in the center. We're going to do part two today of the message that I started last Sunday. And I need to resist the temptation to reteach what I taught last Sunday, even as I review it, because I won't get done today, and I would like to get done today so that next Sunday I can preach the message on the scoffers of the Lord's return. So you'll see in your bulletin, and you'll see on the screen as we quickly move in through it, the uh, four reasons, the first four reasons why we know that Christ must return. And the text that we gave last week uh, is still, of course, a good text. In Acts 1.11, the angel said, This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come again in the same manner as you saw him go into heaven. And we, we said last week that, that he saw him go physically and visibly and suddenly, and so he's coming back the same way. All right? It's not, we're not talking about some spirit or some ghost or he's coming back through his people or through love. We're talking about an actual, literal, physical return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And uh, the promises of God demand it. The teaching of Christ demands it. The witness of the Holy Spirit through the writers of Scripture demands it. And the program for the church uh, demands it. So all four of those we talked about last week. If you were not here last week, you can either see it online uh, on our church website or on YouTube. Or you can uh, ask for a CD. And uh, I'm glad that we have the opportunity. I appreciate our webmaster and the others, that uh, people that work on the uh, video in the room and the cameras because we have a lot of people now that are seeing them on the Internet and they are, uh, I'm getting messages asking if they can uh, purchase them and get the, get the teaching. So I'm glad that we have the opportunity to spread God's Word in this way. Today we're going to look at the fifth reason why we know Christ must return, and that's because the future of Israel demands it. The future of Israel demands it. Now I could speak for the whole hour, and I won't speak an hour, I usually speak a half an hour. But I could speak for an hour or more on the nation Israel, and I can't, I don't have time to do that. We are going to do that and many other subjects in our Wednesday night teaching starting September the 9th. September the 9th. I'm going to begin uh, a, a series called uh, Eschatology End Times, and we're going to be teaching that, and uh, I have some good news that we can uh, announce. Lancaster Bible College has invited us to affiliate with them once again uh, through our Bible Institute, and they're willing to give CEUs uh, for people who go through the course that we teach here. And we'll make that information available to you this week. That just happened over the weekend. Uh, I received that memorandum of understanding between Capital Bible Church and Lancaster. So we'll make that this week. We'll set, put that out in the advertisement. About you don't have to. You don't have to sign up to get a CEU to come to the Bible study. You can come, and you don't have to. You know. Uh, enter as a college uh, course, but if you want to, you can. And, after 10 hours of teaching that, they'll give us uh, CEUs. And that'll give me more time to teach in depth on this. Now, here's the problem with people today. The problem with people today is they look at what's going on in the world and they say, well, Israel has rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, so God's done with them. Well, Israel did reject Christ as their Messiah. The Bible says that, and the Bible said they would for a time but the Bible does not say, in fact, it says the opposite. God has not abandoned Israel, all right? Now, very quickly, you want to mark down Isaiah 54, 7 to 10. I'm going to show you both Old Testament and New Testament where God speaks about his people, the, the nation Israel. In Isaiah 54, 7 to 10, the scripture says, for a mere moment, God is speaking about Israel. And you should mark these verses down because a lot of people today think, well, you know, the nation Israel is no more uh, God's chosen people. They say that's been replaced by the church. And that's not true. Watch what God says. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment. You see that? For a moment. 
But with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I swore that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shut apart, the hills be removed. Watch. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. So there it is. Okay? Very obvious. God says, I will not permanently forsake you. For a moment, for a mere moment, God says, I have forsaken you. And he says, my kindness will not depart from you. Now, when is this going to happen? When is God going to save Israel? Well, Zechariah 12.10 is an old, another Old Testament prophecy. Then I'm going to take you into Romans. Where the Bible talks about Israel mourning over the one whom they pierced. Zechariah 12.10 I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So God says there's going to come a time when the nation Israel is going to mourn their piercing of the Son of God. Now, in the Apostle Paul's day, a lot of Gentiles were coming into the church in greater number than Jewish converts. And that's one reason why Paul was so burdened for his own people, as he says in Romans. Now, if you would like to see in the New Testament the, the three chapters where God through the Apostle Paul says what he's doing with the nation Israel and the Gentiles, it's Romans 9, 10, and 11. And I want you to notice what Paul says in Romans 9, 1. I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great heaviness, continual sorrow in my heart, I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites. So Paul said, now listen to this, because I don't think any of us today could say this. I, I'm not ready to say it. I, I should be. So should you. But here's what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, I would be willing to give up my place in heaven. That's when, when he says I could be a curse from Christ. I would be willing to give up my own place in heaven if by doing so I could save my people, my countrymen. That's, a, that's amazing compassion. Paul cared that his people found Christ as Savior, the Messiah. Look at chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire. And prayer to God for Israel is what? That they might be saved. Paul said, my, my heart's desire for Israel, my burden, is that they may be saved. Because I bear them not witness they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are seeking to establish their own righteousness. And that's through, of course, the law. Now, look at chapter 11. In chapter 11, you have a statement much like Isaiah 54. Look at Romans 11.1. 1. You should mark this in your Bible so you'll know when people say, well, God's done with Israel because they rejected him as Messiah. That's what people say today. God's done with the Jews because they rejected him as Messiah. All right, look at Romans 11. I say then, has God cast away his people? Okay, question. Certainly not. Absolutely not, Paul says. I also, and Paul gives himself here as an illustration, I also am an Israelite. He said, I'm a Jew of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Now look at verse 2. You cannot get more precise than Romans 11.2. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. He said, no, God's not done it. So what's the answer? Here's the answer. Look at Romans chapter 11, down in verse 7. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, that is through their rejection of Messiah, 
to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And then Paul says, I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, so I can provoke to jealousy those who are my own countrymen and save some of them. Now, I don't have time to, to dig this out for you. It's pretty clear, though, and especially if you can read it in a modern English scripture. Here's what, here's what the rest of those verses say as we go down to 17. Paul says that, that the natural branches, which were Israel, they were broken off and some other branches were grafted in. Well, if you're a Gentile and not it's anybody that's not Jewish, you can be thankful that God allowed other branches to be grafted in because that's us, okay? That's the Gentiles. And in verse 19, he says, you'll say then branches were broken off and I might be grafted in. He said, well said, because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. Don't be haughty, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. So consider the goodness and severity of God and those who felt severity but toward you goodness. Now, look at verse 25. I do not desire, brothers, that you be ignorant of this mystery, so you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Now watch. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now look at verse 26. Underline this first phrase. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He'll turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. Romans 11, 26, another translation says it like this. And that is how all Israel will be saved. It is written in the scriptures, the Savior will come from Jerusalem. He will take away all evil from the family of Jacob. So, God says that he's going to save the nation Israel. And you know when that's going to actually finally happen? It'll happen at the Battle of Armageddon. And later I'm going to turn you to Romans 19, so I won't go there now. But that's when the, the Messiah, Prince of Peace, comes back. And that's when Israel is saved from extermination. Because I'm sad to tell you, all the nations of the world, that's including America, if we're still around, all the nations of the world are going to be gathered against Israel. All the nations. And it's going to look like Satan's going to have his way. And God's chosen people are going to be wiped out. And then... The Messiah comes back with the armies of heaven and he destroys the nations of the, the Antichrist the, in the Battle of Armageddon. That's when the Prince of Peace will be recognized and they'll look on him whom they pierced. So the future of Israel demands it and we're going to get into the timetable of all that and the, not, not just the timetable but the outline of events, the order in our Wednesday night series. Number six, Christ has to return because the evil in the world demands it. The world's a very wicked place. The Bible says when the Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father with his angels, he will recompense every man according to his deeds, Matthew 16, 27. John 5, 28, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth. Those who did the good deeds to the resurrection of life those who committed evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. The blessed hope of every believer, Titus 2.13, is the terror of the world. Because for unbelievers, his coming means immediate impartial judgment. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1.9 and 10. People everywhere are telling how you stopped worshiping idols. Began serving the living true God. How you wait for God's Son, whom God raised from the dead, to come from heaven. He is Jesus who saves us from God's angry judgment that is sure to come. Jude 14 and 15. Enoch said about these people, Look, the Lord is coming with many thousands of his holy angels to judge every person. He is coming to punish all who are against God for all the evil they have done. He'll punish the sinners who are against God for all the evil they have said against him. So let me just say this to you. You should not get yourself unduly exercised. And i got to be over how evil our country has become because it's going to get worse and worse and worse. All right, and I'm not glad about that. So that's, I'm saying, I don't mean when I say don't get exercised that it shouldn't, that you should approve of it. But what I'm saying is this, 
The Bible says it's going to get worse and worse. All right? And the worse it gets, the closer we have to be to the Lord's return. Do you understand? And he's not going to allow... See, people think, well, they're getting away with something. No, the world's not getting away with anything. All right? In Revelation 19, 11 to 16, you have the Battle of Armageddon scene. And, and let me quickly show you that, okay? Revelation 19, 11 to 16. And this is, again, when God, through his son Jesus Christ, comes back in judgment on the world. Now, the judgment on the world is going to begin before Revelation 19. In fact, Revelation chapters 6 to 19 are the chapters in the Bible that deal with what is called the tribulation. We're not going to be here. The word church is 30 times in the first five chapters. In chapter 6 to 19, you don't find the word church because we're not here. We're in heaven. All right? But watch this. Revelation, in fact, I hope you like to ride horses because you're going to get your chance. And if you don't like to, you'll learn how quick. All right? You don't need to worry about it. All right? Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and, a whole, and a whole, behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. This is the Lord Jesus. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. Now watch this. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That's you and me. You say, well, how do you know it's talking about us? Because the other people in heaven, the other beings are angels. And this is not angels. You say, well, I don't know if I'm com comfortable fighting. You don't have to fight. Watch this. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has his, on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 19, And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So who wins? Look at the next verse. The beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. Those who worshipped in his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat in the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So that's when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in judgment on the earth. Now, that's for unbelievers, that judgment. For believers, it's unmitigated joy. Revelation 22, 12. Listen, I am coming soon. I will bring my reward with me, and I will repay each one of you for what you have done. So Jesus must return in order to execute just retribution on sinners, to carry out the judgment he has promised, and also to reward his saints. So the evil in the world demands it. Number seven, the vindication of Christ demands it. The vindication. It is inconceivable that the last public view the world would have of Jesus Christ would be that of a bleeding, dying, crucified criminal covered with blood, spit, and flies hanging naked in the Jerusalem twilight being mocked, reviled, and blasphemed. Go to Matthew 27. I'll show you that. Matthew 27. And I, le I learned something this week that I had not thought of before as I was studying the Scripture. And I, I've been privileged to study it for 50 plus years and I learned something new every week. And I'm happy about that. I'm glad. Because you never can learn it all. You're never going to know it all. That's why I'm, I enjoy continuing to study and teach. Matthew 27, 35 to 44. Then they crucified him, divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments for my clothing, and they cast lots. This is talking about Jesus now dying on the cross for your sins and mine. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. They put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Those who passed by, verse 39, blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You said 
you would destroy the temple in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders, said he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he's the king of the Jews, let him come down from the cross. We'll believe in him. He trusted in God, let God deliver him now, if he'll have it. He said, I'm the Son of God. Even the robbers crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. From the sixth hour till the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I have the answer to that question. I have written for myself right across the top of my Bible. That's why I love to write notes on my Bible. He was forsaken. Listen to this. So I would never be forsaken. Hebrews 13.5. He was forsaken, so you and I would never be forsaken. Hebrews 13, 5. Isaiah 53, 3 says that he was bruised and he was afflicted and he opened out his mouth. Now, did you ever stop to realize in this? I just realized this this week. That when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he never appeared in a public venue before unbelievers. Check it out, you know, later. When Jesus appeared, he was 50 days on the earth. All of his appearances, as we read about who he appeared to, was believers. So the last view that the world had of Jesus was right here. The unsaved world. The last picture they had of Jesus was of him hanging on a cross in that description I just read for you there. Being reviled and mocked and blasphemed and dying. And that's why I say that the vindication of Christ demands it. The unbelieving world will see his glory displayed to everyone. Hebrews 9.28 says this. Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. The Savior who was humiliated, taunted, and put to death in a public display of humanity's hatred of God will return as conquering Lord in view of the entire world. Luke 21.25-27. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On earth, nations will be afraid, confused. People will be so afraid they'll faint, wondering what's happening to the world because the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, Luke 21, 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's the world. That's, that's everybody. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1, 7. So he must come back because the vindication of Christ demands it. The last picture the world's going to have is not Jesus hanging on the cross. By the way, and no offense is intended to the, to the religion that I'm, you know, talking about because probably other religions use it too. But I wear, I, I choose to wear a cross, but I don't wear a crucifix. You know why? Because I don't, my Savior is not still hanging on the cross. And I'm not meaning to judge or condemn anybody. If you have one, I'm not saying you're wrong. But I'm saying that I'll wear a cross proudly, happily, to remind myself of my Savior. But it won't be with, with Jesus hanging on it, see. Because that may be the last picture that the world had of him, but the last picture that believers had of him was up from the grave he arose, okay? See? And they saw him ascending to heaven, the disciples did. Number eight, the destruction of Satan demands it. The destruction of Satan demands the Lord's return. Satan is an already defeated foe as far as Christians are concerned, but he still exercises a dominion over this world. Now here's some titles for Satan in the Bible. In John 12, 31 and 14, 30 and 16, 11, he's called the ruler of this world. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan is called the God with a little g of this world. In Ephesians 2, 2 and, and 6, 12, he's called the prince of the power of the air. 
In 1 John 5, 19, the Bible says, The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. But Christ is the only rightful ruler of this world, and when he returns, he will overthrow and destroy Satan completely. In Revelation 5, Christ receives the seven-sealed scroll, the title deed of the earth. He unleashes judgment with the crack of each seal. That's Revelation 6 and 7. Then the seven seal judgments give way to the judgment of the seven trumpets, Revelation 8 and 9. The seven trumpet judgments lead to the judgment of the seven bowls, that's Revelation 16. Finally, after one last ditch effort by Satan to retain his unlawful dominion, Christ himself returns, like I showed you in Revelation 19, to vanquish Satan. He chains him, casts him into a bottomless pit, and finally confines him to an eternal lake of fire. Now, Revelation 20.10 is, is a verse that you need to know. It says, Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, here's another sad thing that we have in our modern culture today among Christians. We have a bunch of preachers that are preaching now that hell isn't real. It's not a, it's not a real, you know. Well, what is it, make-believe? Are you kidding me? And, and this would be pitiful if it wasn't so, so sad. Now, let me, let me tell you something. Hell and the lake of fire is a real place. It's a real hot place. Now, who was it made for? It was made for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41, okay? And there, I just showed you, the devil's sent there. You say, well, what about anybody else? Matthew 25, 46 says that some people go away into everlasting punishment and other people into everlasting life. So, my friends, you know why, you know why preachers... Uh, this. Uh, it's pitiful. You know why preachers won't preach that hell's real? Because people don't want to hear it. They're afraid that they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Well, my friend, listen to me. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I'd rather have hurt your feelings and have you get saved than die, wonder, feel wonderful and die and go to hell and feel bad forever. That would be stupid. You know? I'd rather be biblically correct and politically correct any day of the week. Matthew 25, 46 is very plain that while verse 41 says it was made for the devil and his angels, verse 46 says that some people are sent there. In fact, if you're in Revelation 20 still, verse 15 says, anyone that's not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Now, hear me out especially if you don't know Christ as your Savior. God doesn't want you to go to hell. That's why he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And while the Bible says that the, the penalty for sin is death, it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So all you need to do is repent of your sins and put your trust in Jesus Christ and you don't go to the lake of fire. All right? But I'm not going to help you not go there by telling you that it's not real. You don't have to worry about it. See, that'd, that'd be dumb. That'd be like somebody in a burning building saying, Oh, I don't want to go tell those people their house on fire because it might feel bad. So, and you say, what's this have to do with us? You're preaching to the choir here. No, I'm not, because what you need to do is this. You need to not apologize for believing what the Bible says, okay, as a Christian. As you witness to people, they need, you, you need to lovingly let them know that you are trying to tell them the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, because you don't want them to suffer for eternity in the lake of fire. Okay? And it is real. Contra contrary to the false teachers of today who say, oh no, you know, it's not, doesn't mean real fire. Number nine, Christ must return because the hope of the saints demands it. Titus 2.13 says, We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
1 John 3, 2 and 3. Now are we the children of God, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We know when he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now here is the test of a healthy eschatology. And the word eschatology means study of the last days, all right? Is your belief in the Lord's return, does that have a cleansing influence on your life? Are you looking beyond the commotion of this world with a realization that you could soon meet Christ face to face? And are you preparing your heart and soul for that? And like I said last week, and I'm going to say it again today because I think it bears repeating, what unfinished business would you take care of if you knew the Lord was coming tonight? What, in, what unfinished business? Say the Lord is coming at 6 o'clock this evening. What would you do between now and 6 o'clock? What sins would you confess? What relationships would you try to reconcile? What friends would you try to give the gospel of Christ to? Matthew 24, 42 and 44 says this, So also, always be ready, because you don't know the day your Lord will return. Remember this, if the owner of the house knew what time of night a thief was coming, the owner would watch and not let the thief break in. So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at a time you do not expect Him. Now, the, this teaching of the second coming of Christ is not supposed to make you stop what you're doing and just sit around and wait for the Lord's return. And it shouldn't even cause you to focus all your attention on the events and political developments of this world because no one knows the day or the hour, but you and I are supposed to be looking for His appearing. In fact, in 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul characterizes Christians as those who love his appearing. Those who love his appearing. And as we'll see next week from 2 Peter 3, it should motivate us to witnessing about Jesus Christ the Savior. So the last soul in the age of grace can be saved. In fact, that's why Christ hasn't come back yet. Okay? I know why he hasn't come yet. I know. Second Peter three nine tells us. I'm going to I'm going to teach the whole chapter as much as that I can next week. But Second Peter three nine says this: God is not slack concerning the promise of His Son coming back, as some people would say, but He's long suffering to us, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God wants you, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, to repent of your sins and be saved and. When the last soul that God knows is going to be saved in the church age, the age of grace is saved, Jesus Christ will return. And it would be awesome if that would happen some Sunday morning after somebody prayed with me and accept Christ as Savior, bam, the trumpet did That's how it's going to be, somewhere. Okay? There's going to be some, a person saved somewhere in the world, and God's going to say, okay, that's the last person. Sound the trumpet. So if you want to hasten his return, get yourself ready and then spread the good news of the gospel to everybody you can. Let's bow our heads and close with prayer. Please. Now if you are here this morning and you do not know that your sins are forgiven, you don't know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. You do not know that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. But you say, I'd like to know. I can help you to know that. I'd like to invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just silently from your heart of hearts to God's, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. So I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life, forgive my sins, and give me a home in heaven. And give me the assurance of my eternal life. And help me now to live my life for you and tell others about you and not be ashamed 
of what I've done here today. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you pray that prayer from your heart to God's and sincerely meant it, He heard you. And He has saved your eternal soul. I'd like to thank Him for doing that for you. Would you allow me to thank Him by just lifting your hand up? But I'm not going to embarrass you. I'd just acknowledge your hand and you can put it down. And I'd like to thank the Lord for hearing your prayer today and saving you. If you prayed that prayer with me a moment ago, would you just lift your hand right now and put it down? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'd just like to thank the Lord. The Bible says whoever believes on him should not be ashamed. If you prayed it and meant it, just slip your hand up right now. All right, God bless you. Thank you. I saw that hand. Anyone else? The Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall receive eternal life be saved. Christian friends, those of you that did this some time ago, is there somebody that you know you need to really give the gospel to between now and the Lord's return? And, and for whatever reasons, you haven't, you haven't been able to do it yet. But you say, I, I need to do that, Pastor Bill. I need to. Would you slip your hand up right now and say, pray for me that I'll have the boldness to do it, not be afraid. I'll make opportunity. I'll take the time. Yes, God bless you. God bless you and you and you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us today. We thank you for this one that prayed to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I thank you for believers whose hearts are stirred. That they know they have, they have friends and loved ones that would be left behind if they don't try to give them a gospel. So I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives to help us to be willing to use gospel tracts or whatever method works best for us to give the gospel to people give you praise and thanks in Jesus name. Amen. Stand please for the